Bom dia. Sejam bem-vindas e bem-vindos à palestra Infraestrutura Pública Digital e seus impactos nos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Eu vou fazer a minha autodescrição. Eu sou uma mulher branca, de 1,88m, estou usando uma camisa ver... amarela com um colar vermelho, sou loira, cabelo na altura do... dos ombros, mais ou menos, estou usando uma saia preta e um tênis preto. Por gentileza, tomem os seus assentos e coloquem os aparelhos celulares em modo silencioso. A palestra de hoje será em inglês, então, se você precisar, temos equipamentos de tradução aqui na mesa lateral, vi que algumas pessoas já estão usando. Para receber o certificado, é necessário fazer o check-in acessando o formulário através do QR Code que está localizado ali próximo ao café e aqui próximo à mesa dos aparelhos de tradução. Essa é uma parceria entre o Ministério da Gestão e da Inovação em Serviços Públicos por meio da Secretaria Extraordinária para a Transformação do Estado e a Escola Nacional de Administração Pública. E eu gostaria de destacar ainda e agradecer a dedicação e o comprometimento das equipes da ENAP e 7 MGI que se empenharam para que este evento fosse realizado. A palestra internacional Infraestrutura Pública Digital e seus impactos nos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável debaterá a respeito de temas como inclusão financeira, redes de e-commerce, pagamentos digitais e novos frameworks para financiamento de mitigação e adaptação às mudanças climáticas. Será uma oportunidade de falar com um olhar abrangente sobre como a infraestrutura digital pública pode ser fundamental para alcançar os objetivos de desenvolvimento sustentável, promovendo sociedades mais inclusivas e resilientes. Desejamos que esta palestra seja mais um dos muitos momentos proporcionados pela ENAP de aprendizado e troca de experiências. Que os diálogos e trocas aqui realizados sirvam de insumo para inspirar novas ideias, mudanças positivas e a construção de um legado de transformação. Peço aos nossos convidados que iniciem suas falas com a autodescrição, também na hora que forem fazer suas falas. E agora, passo a palavra à presidenta substituta, diretora executiva da ENAP e nossa moderadora, Natália Teles. Bom dia a todas, a todos. Eu vou falar em português agora, só para informar que eu vou falar em inglês. <risos> para facilitar depois, como a gente vai fazer a... a depois a gente vai fazer o upload no YouTube, facilitar a, a, a transcrição e a tradução na plataforma. Tá? E, so, welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone that is live here with us and also uh, greet everyone that will be watching this session uh, in our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll start with my self-description. I'm a white woman. I am. I have curly hair, short hair, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. No, a blue. I don't know. Suit and trousers and a pink blouse and a purple shoes. And but it's good overall. It's not. Very <laughs> it's, it, it sounds not so good, but it, it, it matches. Um, I would also like to greet our invited speakers, Dr. Anit Mukachi, I don't know, Senior Fellow at ORF America, and Druva Jaisanska, <laughs> Executive Director at ORF America. Uh, I'm, I would like also to greet our discussant today, Guilherme Almeida, my colleague, who works at the Extraordinary Secretariat for State Transformation at the Ministry of Management and Public Service Innovation. It's a pleasure to be here and to have you all here with us. First, I would like to inform you that I'm representing here President Betania. Um, she's a great enthusiast of the of the subject, and she's not she was not able to to be here today, but she's the 
great supporter of digital transformation and SDGs here at ENAP, especially SDG 5, gender equality, and SDG 13, climate action. That's our uh, commitment as a school to support this agenda. I'm sure she would have loved to be here, and she had the opportunity to tell me that in person. Um, this event is an opportunity for us to discuss the potential of digital public infrastructure. And it's also very um, time appropriate. The timing is perfect because of the G20 discussions that are going on and all the initiatives that the ministry has in place uh, leads us to the need to discuss and broadcast some of this reflection so that we can improve and um, elevate our decisions towards the team. So Brazil this year presides over G20, which includes a digital economy working group, which ENAP is also supporting and part of the discussions. So um, we are definitely committed to prioritizing the development of a public, a digital public infrastructure that is reliable and inclusive. That said, I will um, pass the word to Guy, so he can give you a few words, and then we will hear from you, uh, our stars of uh, this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, uh, Annie. Thank you, Druva. Uh, I wanted to give some initial words to bring some context to, co to the conversation. Uh, really, not even one year ago, here at this school, we hosted the ninth edition of our Public Sector Innovation Week. And uh, usually, it's a moment in which we bring different approaches, visions, and perspectives of what's going on around the world on public sector innovation and what could be done to transform government. And it's a big conference for 5,000 people, more 20,000 more online and so on. And at the moment, we had two keynote speakers. One was Raul Matan, and the other was Dave Eves. Uh, and they both brought the conversation around the topic of digital public infrastructure. And, well, this resonated quite well because to a certain extent, what we heard sound really familiar to what we had been doing along the years in the context of Brazilian digital government. On the other hand, maybe some missing spots of the strategy could resemble to things we were trying to do, but we're not achieving to so far. <laughs> so um, we, uh, as Natalia just mentioned, we were also in the context of G20 discussions, and we could better connect with the conversations around digital public infrastructure, our ministry, Minister for uh, Management and Public Services Innovation. She was also in the know and she understood the relevance of that and she gave a speech on that topic in a side event to the United Nations General Assembly that year as well. And we started to uh, better connect with the concept, understand how it could reflect the Brazilian uh, reality on digital government, and as a last uh, round of uh, evolutions in our approaches, we just passed a national strategy for digital government, which not only defines digital public infrastructures, uh, recognizes its relevance for the implementation of policies nationwide, and, but also determines to some extent that the federal government will assist states and municipalities in providing digital government and that it will mostly do so not by providing last mile services but mostly by providing infrastructures that allow services to be provided. So it's it somehow working 
as uh, uh, the missing piece in the in this puzzle so far at least and then there's strategy to be developed uh, but it's a tra trajectory so far so we are in the process not only of developing a concept of engaging people into it of disseminating knowledge and i understand that this conference and this conversation is part of this knowledge building and knowledge management and knowledge dissemination process but we are also in the making of somehow uh, transposing to use a musical term, uh, the, the logic of digital public infrastructures to a Brazilian context and to a Brazilian audience. We just had a mission with 25 people at Chi Bangalore in which um, policy makers, uh, people from uh, tech experts, um, government and civil society were able to deep dive into the context, uh, the nuts and bolts, the logics, and the intersection of policy and technology. Uh, and to a great extent, we noticed that we are in the right track. But as I mentioned, this is an ongoing process. So uh, whichever opportunities we might have to bring this at first sight uh, abstract concept to a broader audience, and more than that, to reflect and to connect the broader digital public infrastructure uh, con uh, um, or expression meaning to a real life in Brazilian policy context, this will certainly help us to have more uh, precise, accurate, and effective public services and a better country particularly to the extent we are aligned with SDGs in that process. So this is the broader context I wanted to give you on our trajectory and then missions and conversations and so on. And there's an, uh, an ecosystem on that in the making in Brazil. And whichever we may help uh, to create that, we may count on you to assist on that, it's most welcome. I wanted to give this initial remarks, not only to give some context to the audience and to the public who will watch this later on, but also to help you to frame your, your presentations on that moment, on that challenge, and, and that uh, group of great opportunities you have bef before us. Thank you so much, and I'll give you the floor. First, um this is an amazing thing that you do, a self-description. So I will do a self-description. Uh, I, I am an Indian man with black, well, gray hair, brown skin, wearing a blue suit with a blue shirt, glasses, um, and black shoes. Um, I look very Brazilian. Uh, first of all, thank you. Natalia, thank you, Guy. Uh, it is an honor for us to be here. It is an exciting, very, very exciting time in the relationship between the two countries. And I would say the relationship that defines a lot of the relationship across the global south. These are two countries which are leaders for global south and we are democracies we come with similar as i will explain similar fiscal structures similar problems social economic and some political and i think just the fact that we are here representing orf america which is a foundation which um, a research policy research think tank based in washington dc with no other, we are the only think tank based in the Global South. We are the overseas affiliate of India's largest think tank called Observer Research Foundation. That's why it's ORF. We are in Washington DC as the only think tank from the Global South with permanent presence in the think tank capital of the world. And therefore, our job is not only to look at India in a global context, but also as a, as a space for other countries from the global south to come together 
because many of the decisions that affect our people are made about three blocks from where we work. World Bank, IMF, IDB, several think tanks which determine the policy and the politics of the world. So it's an open invitation to you, to your colleagues to come and you have a home in Washington DC which you will feel very comfortable. We also have good coffee. So with that, I think what I'll do is I'll do a short presentation and uh, unfortunately Bethania couldn't be here but this whole event started when I did a small presentation in an online event. I haven't met her, actually. I've never met Vitania. But in that event, I presented on the stra India's strategy for digital public infrastructure and how it can relate to broader so uh, sustainable development goals and other goals. And after that event, she reached out with Alexandre here, thank you very much for organizing this as well. And I said, I'm coming to Brazil, so we'll have, we can have a talk. And, I, and my colleague Dhruva has also been very kind to accompany me, and we reached Belém, and now we are in Brazil, and we are really honored for you to host us. So I'll just do a quick presentation, and then we can, I'll pass the mic to, to Dhruva, and we can have a conversation. And I wanted to make a conversation. So the presentation is just for the conversation. And I'll I stand up. Thank you. So just as the presentation is coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, thank you. The idea is to give a brief background of what we are calling digital public infrastructure. Infrastructura publica digital. So <laughs> it's like, um, and how does it relate to countries like Brazil, like India, but we will start with India and then I will come to Brazil a little bit. But first, I want to thank Brazil. And I, when I went back to India after my PhD in Japan in 2003, um, I started working with India's government think tank, like enough, but not as beautiful. By the way, this is one of the most beautiful meeting rooms I've ever been to. Um, we started learning about Bolsa Familia. And at that time in India, the politics was changing and the policies were moving more towards a rights-based approach to development. So one of the first rights that were enacted was right to information which also Brazil had enacted in, in the late 90s. Then we had a right to education, right to food. So suddenly the social politics of India, social policies, politics, as well as how the government spent the money was changing and changing very fast. Right? These were programs of hundreds of billions of dollars in just numbers. Sorry, India is big numbers. So I'll give you a big number. In five years, between 2004 and 2010, India appointed two million teachers in schools. Two million in five years. It was crazy. Built 150,000 schools, new schools, in five years. It was, if you go, if you went to a rural area, you will see just schools being built, health centers being built. I mean, it was incredible. The other thing that was happening is this discussion that what is the best way to provide services, government services? And we, in India for a long time, we had transfers from the federal government or the state government to the people for many things, mostly rural public works. You build a small road, there are five laborers, you, pay, you get paid $2 per day, that's the money goes. The, I, the thing was that we were pretty convinced that the money doesn't reach. Most of them are, are, do not reach the final beneficiaries. 
So when Bolsa Familia, and before that Progresa in Me Mexico, which became uh, another Oportunidades, uh, when cash transfers came as a model for how you can transfer that money directly to the people, I came here in 2008, and you know, before that I had lived in Brazil for a while, but this was the combination of a CPF, which is Brazil's more or less universal ID number. Then you had the Bolsa Familia debit card, where you get the 50 reais or 100 reais, and then you go to a supermarket. You had a Portal da Transparencia, right, where I could sit in India and track every family who is receiving this money. I, could, I actually did that. Um, that this is incredible, like to be able to see a family in Bahia receiving Bolsa Familia, and I'm sitting in India. So Portal da Transparencia, and a distributed network, financial network, very distributed financial network, which brought banking and financial services closer to the people. Now, these four, I think, inspired us to say, what do we do to move from what we are, where we are? Yes, infrastructure is important. But if we have to have a really good way of transferring money, what do we need to do? So as Guy said, in my mind, this is also digital public infrastructure, which Brazil built over many years. So, I t we try to define DPIs, what is digital public infrastructure, but as you can see, it is complicated. We've tried to summarize what DPI is. And the green parts are essential, what the characteristic of DPIs are. So let me s start. One is, it's shared digital utilities. It could be platforms, it could be networks, and I'm I'll come to that later. It is powered by interoperable standards. So it is not a platform where one company determines how you buy a product from Amazon, Amazon will do the logistics, Amazon will do the payments. No. This is an open standard, open network specifications. It's somewhat like the internet. HTTP, SMTP, all the protocols are open standards, right? And the important thing is there are a set of rules, a set of rules which enable these transactions with equal access, which is important for inclusion, equal access to individuals or institutions, and this is something that we have been working on. It's sovereignty and control, and Guy can speak a little bit to that. And these are all to drive innovation, inclusion, and competition. The idea is not to have an open, just a closed system. The idea is to have what we call a stack. A stack on the left-hand side is the classic definition. This is exactly what I said in that big slide to this one. At the base is a digital ID. Then we have a, some sort of payments. And then over that is a data exchange. So these are the three classic ways we define a DPI. Me and some others, we are not comfortable with this definition anymore. Why? Because we have moved beyond payments. Payments was just one. Bolsa Familia, India's uh, what we call direct benefit transfer. Now, and more, it will become more and more important, is how do you manage your digital IDs? For India, and I will come to this, we have a system called Aadhaar, which is a biometric ID for 1.3 billion people. Everyone has a biometric ID, right? But they also have a Google ID. Increasingly, they will have synthetic IDs with face and fingerprints and other things. Who knows? With AI, I mean, I don't want to talk about AI very much, but 
with computational power like quantum, you will probably have two different variation of the same person. So one person can sit here, the other person can sit somewhere else in a meeting. Possible. It's a future, right? So how do you manage digit IDs? So that's going to be the part of the digital public infrastructure. The rules have still not been made. The middle part is all we know is digital credentials. A certificate that you issue from an app, digitally signed, is a digital credential. A bank account is a digital credential. A health record is a digital credential. So there's a big layer of credentials in different sectors. It can be employment, it can be health, it can be education, anything. And then on top, we have a transaction network. People are transacting in that network. And that is the power of open networks, where the health can transact with education, can transact with government services. So the transaction network then takes over on an open platform. That is what I would define as digital public infrastructure. Now, how does this all come together? Sorry about the change. I'm not a very good visual graphics person. but So it's essentially about three things. And I'll speed up a little bit. It's about policy. Sorry, it's about digital infrastructure in different areas, connectivity, trust, finance, health, education, energy. You take any sector. You can put on that a digital infrastructure, public infrastructure. Then there are markets, so market for companies, startups, government agencies like you help, ENAP helps government agencies, nonprofits. That is the market, and market in a broad sense. And the third are enabling policies like the privacy, data protection, interoperability, portability. All these can be defined. So this is a circular frame in which we would like to implement a digital public infrastructure. Now, how did India go about? Our philosophy, and now we have kind of made it into a slogan, is don't build small and try to scale. Like scaling what works doesn't work for a country, especially of size of India or Brazil. Build at population scale. Build at a scale where everyone can be included. So for Brazil, it will be 200 million. For India, it is 1.4 billion. For Indonesia, it's 250 million. So when you build a system, build at scale, and then let the system work itself out. For that, you need public investment. And that is the whole reason why we have digital public infrastructure. So we went about with Aadhaar, which is our biometric ID, the bank account uh, where the government directed the banks to open bank accounts. So about 500 million bank accounts were opened in three years, 500 million, three times the size of Brazil. Um, then we had a health mission. We have a transfer, cash transfer, DBT Bharat is like Bolsa Familia. Diksha is an online education skills training platform managed by the government. So all textbooks in India come with QR code. So every textbook, every chapter comes with a QR code. Why? Because it's a very textbook based system. So the teacher sometimes just teaches the textbook, what is written. Now with a smartphone, with the QR code, that even the teacher can have access to material, extra material, from other sources. And so the students also. So QR-coded textbook expands the knowledge base from just what is written in the textbook to what is available outside through an open interface. And finally, the unified payments interface, which is India's version of PIX or as we would like to call it, PIX is India's, Brazil's version of UPI, but we are friends, so we are, we are, we are good. It's, it, both systems are really, really fantastic. Okay, so 
Now, how does it all relate to SDGs? How do we bring all this together? And we have tried in this small chart to summarize the 17 goals and the length of those arrows rays and we don't have a proper methodology methodology but some initial calculations we did with some indices and we think that the biggest impact of dpi or digital public infrastructure will be on poverty reduction on health on education quality like i just mentioned the QR textbooks, coded textbooks, gender equality. Why? Because digital public infrastructure is inclusive. You include everyone, and by inclusive means everyone. <laughs> so my mother now pays with, she's 80 years old, she pays in the market with a QR code on digital payments. She takes her phone, boom, with a QR code, puts in the money, and pays. And I'm amazed. She's 80. She learned this. So <laughs> it's, it's quite impressive to see that. Not because I'm involved in man making the system, but it was very nice to see her use it. We also think that done right, and this is important, done right, it can reduce inequalities. Because again, the philosophy is inclusion. Philosophy is nobody is left behind. And if you take that philosophy, and I have, I, I'll share this presentation is, is obviously to share. And the, the explanation is what can you do with the physical, for example, in inequality, you can use big data. You can run analytics for particular areas. For example, we are in Belain, you have kilombolas. Now, you see a mapping of kilombolas, and then you see some of them have higher education, some of them not. So instead of just saying all kilombolas are, you know, are disadvantaged, within that, you know, universe, there are kilombolas in Belling, near Belling, which are probably as good or even maybe even better than other disadvantages. So I'm saying that using machine learning, big data targeting delivery, you can actually make it, make digital public infrastructure reduce inequalities. And the last one I will say is climate change. Now, how does it work? How is a digital public infrastructure related to climate change? I would say very simple. It is to reduce information gaps across different sectors. I'll give you a concrete example. In India today, in, in cities, a lot of people are using e-bikes. Right? Guy must have seen. And what happens is, the battery runs down. You are going from, to your home, the battery runs down. What you can do is you can search on an open network where a battery swap station is. So it's like a postage gasolina. So you go to put you know, gasoline in your tank here, and these are small shops. They have 100 batteries for a particular e-bike. You find that which is the closest. They post the price. You go in there, change the battery. He charges the battery, and he sells it to somebody else gives it to somebody else. If you think of the impact on climate, if we talk about energy transition, clean mobility, I don't need, I, we live in the United States, and my neighbors, everyone have their individual chargers outside their home. In India, we can't do that. First of all, standards have not been set. So due to a public infrastructure with information flows, open network, we can actually make a solution. Okay, I'll do two more things that I'll stop. One is that across the world, if digital public infrastructure has to be implemented, we need to reduce cost of data. 
people can't keep paying $100. Like, we pay about $80 per, per month in the United States. Brazil, is cost of data is pretty high also, right? In India, we have been able to reduce it to zero, literally zero. Every day I, I charge, recharge my parents' phone, they have 1.5 GB per day allocation for $3 per month. So it's free. So you have people learning on YouTube, sitting on a train, on a metro. They, they take courses on YouTube, coming back and forth from work, because it's free, and the quality is very good. Brazil is, to my mind, pretty high still. We need to reduce the cost of data for the impact to happen. And this is my favorite slide, PIX and UPI. This is a solution that are made in Brazil, in India, independently, using exactly the same philosophy. And the impact has been stunning, absolutely amazing. Now, in India, because of the big size of the country, we do more transactions. In Brazil, because your income is higher, you have more value. But it is exactly the same. And here, my submission to you, Natalia, and everybody else is, and Guy has been in India, that this is a model that Brazil and India can offer to the rest of the world. If we get it right, this is going to be a model for other countries not, which are not at that advanced stage. So I'll leave that to you for thinking about it. Now, I'll not do get this, but I'll just in, end with something that Dhruva and I were in Belém. On Tuesday, we launched something called Hedge Belém Abeth, Open Belém Network. And this is a running network, exactly what we've discussed. We start with skilling. If there is a website, you can go and check what it is also a, um, a, a document. Hedge Belém Abeth is the first attempt at an open network using the philosophy that we've discussed in India, in, in outside India. So Belém is the first. Why Belém? Several reasons. One is we have friends there. Second is it's going to host the COP. It's going to host the COP next year. And it's not an easy thing to organize. You need more people with skills, kids, children, adults, everyone. You have two countries get together and implement something. The teams from India and Brazil worked for 17 hours a day, for five days straight. They used to sleep in turns to make that connection work. But we know now how to make it work. So it's something that is for Brazil, made by a collaboration with India. And I think it also, I'm handi I'll hand over to Dhruva to talk more about how this is part of our ethos of collaboration with Brazil, with other countries, that we want a better world. We want more inclusion. We want less discrimination. And if there is a way that we can construct that, I'll be very happy. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Anit. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, it is my first time in Brazil, uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we spent four days in Belen and then two days here in Brasilia. Um, but uh, I am not, uh, you know, I run a, a think tank in, in Washington, ORF America, as uh, Anit mentioned. Uh, I'm not an economist, I'm not a technologist, but today, almost every aspect of public policy. Uh, I come you know, on from defense and security, but you, you, you know, we can talk about economic development, we can be talking about energy transitions, we can talk about social inclusion. Um, uh, every aspect of public policy today is affected by technology. And so I feel like if we're, you're a public policy professional like myself, today we cannot do our job without trying to understand, at the very least, how technology is affecting our, uh, the things we care about. And in many ways, these are now interlinked uh, much more than they were before. 
Uh, technology has always been, I, what I'll, I'll try to do is just situate or place uh, India's DPI uh, efforts that we've heard about in a larger context of how India is approaching technology. Uh, and it's not going to be the same. I think in Brazil there'll be some differences, but I do think it's, it's always interesting to learn from each other. One of the things I've been trying to do the last few days is also learn what can, what can we learn from Brazil's experience because, there, as, as Anit pointed out, there are many areas where we have benefited from Brazil's experiences, and again, there are many areas where Brazil could possibly benefit from India's experiences as well. So um, I, what I uh, would do is I, I think we have to look at the broader context. Technology has always, as I mentioned, always played a role, whether it was telegraph, you know, phone, telephones, railways, computer, early computerization, radio, um, nuclear fission. Technology has off, always had a transformative effect. But a few things have accelerated in uh, uh, development since the 1990s particularly the digital revolution. And it is now, you know, we all were, we have smartphones, we all uh, live digital lives. And so in some ways that has really had, had a truly transformative effect. But a few things have changed just in the last few years. We all felt the effects of the pandemic. Uh, and suddenly a lot of things that we took for granted, that we would get supplies at our stores, because you know, even if manufacturing has gone all over the world, it would be you know, we, it'd be easy to get uh, vaccines or uh, uh, protective equipment or masks. Suddenly, we found that was not the case. So a globalized world uh, suddenly was seen, seen to be vulnerable. Uh, we had we had built-in vulnerabilities that we had not paid sufficient attention to. We have uh, greater geopolitical frictions between Russia and Europe and Ukraine. Uh, between Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East, uh, between China and the United States and ta Taiwan and, and other countries in, in Asia. And so suddenly this idea that cooperation was inevitable, uh, I think there are now question marks about that at the national level. Uh, Russia's largest exporter of gas was to Europe, and that did not stop Russia from risking that to wage a war in Ukraine. Um, we are all concerned about uh, economic growth and employment, uh, youth, the, the growing political demands by youth for jobs. Uh, even, you know, we have, we, education standards have improved, and yet you see very high youth um, uh, empl unemployment or underemployment in Europe, in the European Union, and particularly some countries in China, in India, in, uh, in Latin America as well. Um, countries are competing with each other to who has better uh, talent, who has better companies, who is more, you know, and so that is adding. And finally, there's also competition in third countries uh, for influence, uh, you know, whether again in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Africa, yeah, elsewhere. So a combination of these factors are now influencing technology policy, for India particularly. We have growing tensions between India and China. Uh, or geopolitical tensions. We have the fallout of the Ukraine war and energy shortages. We had a shortage of health supplies during the pandemic. Um, and so all of this is now driving a new approach in some ways to technology policy. And increasingly, if you talk at the national level to officials in the United States, in Europe, in India, elsewhere, they share many of these same concerns. Um, now, what are these technologies? It's, in some ways, technology is everything and nothing. Uh, so I, I've categorized it from India's point of view. I think there are four main categories. One is what we call strate traditional strategic technologies. Uh, this includes nuclear, uh, space, defense, um, and, and areas that are potentially dual use. Uh, technologies that can be used for military purposes, but also civilian purposes. These have been around now for 60, 70 years. They have, we have very complicated international and domestic uh, export control agreements on, on these. So this has been one area where there's always been uh, national effort to, to master and compete. A second is, I mentioned the critical digital technology, uh, which is the hardware, uh, semiconductors, electronics manufacturing, uh, telecom networks, um, satellites, uh, but also now the software and the digital public infrastructure that Anand spoke about. And that I think represents a second very important line of effort just because of how important it is for our day-to-day -day lives and national infrastructure. A third area is what I would very loosely call emerging technologies, where in some cases we've made 
uh, technological breakthroughs, but we have not yet seen the, fully the commercial applications of that. And this includes artificial intelligence, AI, uh, quantum computing, uh, automation, drones. Uh, again, increasingly pervasive, but we don't yet fully understand or fully know what the, the applications can be, uh, particularly the public policy applications. And finally, I would say lump two rather different things together, which are clean and green technologies. Uh, f which are important for climate change and for the energy transition that we all hope to accomplish, uh, as well as biotechnologies uh, that are emerging. And so these represent, in some ways, the key efforts that India has focused on um, to, uh, as part of, again, this sort of newed f renewed focus on technology policy. Finally, what is India doing about this? What, what can we do? We can admire the problem, but I think, that, again, there, there are several lines of effort. One is um, that you now have a large amounts, billions of dollars of public and private and non-governmental and multinational investment. Uh, we all need money to make this work. Uh, and that money has to come from somewhere. In India, we've tried different kinds of approaches, uh, a lot of uh, blended or matching financing. Um, but uh, one in the past three years or so, or three or four years, we've seen very large public funding, uh, public uh, uh, subsidies going towards these key, key sectors. The two ways of doing it, some of it is upfront capital costs. Uh, you see this in, again, semiconductors is a good example of that, where India has spent 10, 11 billion dollars on in building up a semiconductor manufacturing infrastructure. But another way is actually in terms of tax incentives. And India is uh, doing what's called production-linked incentives, where if companies produce a certain amount, they get tax credits after, after the fact. And again, this will, we're talking uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars in, in, in these kinds of uh, incentives. An equal challenge, it's not just about money, it's about transferring technology and transferring knowledge. So increasingly now the uh, efforts are being made to tie investment to skill development. Uh, so you actually have local people, uh, you know, previously there was this idea that uh, a, you know, a foreign company could come in, they would bring their own workers, their own, manage, own management, uh, set something up. Today there is increasingly for political reasons often a need to uh, have local buy-in and local, you know, also for the sustainability of some of these efforts. A second uh, line of effort involves policy clarity and regulation. India has very complex regula uh, regulatory structure at the national level, state level, local level. Uh, sometimes states are not coordinated amongst each other. Um, and so one of the efforts is on, on a few key areas, developing what are called national missions that have a single window which, where everything from the financing to the infrastructure uh, to the, the regulatory uh, policy can all be centralized and report directly to a minister or a high-level official. And this is just a way of cutting through a lot of bureaucratic red tape, coordinating better with bet at the, between states and, and the federal government. Um, so again, in, in many of these areas I mentioned, there's now uh, a, a different lines of it. There's a drone, new drones policy, a new AI po strategy that has been uh, come out, uh, a new semiconductor mission, um, uh, you know, DPI efforts, uh, defense policy has also, defense manufacturing policy has also been clarified. So all of the, the, there are these attempts, this cannot be done across the board, but in certain, these are certain policy interventions that have proved necessary. Um, a third effort is in investments in R&D, in uh, research and development. Um, India lags significantly in this respect, which is we have a lot of researchers and a lot of developers, but very poor uh, IP. Um, and you know, if you look at number of pa patents filed, uh, it's it's not as where it should be given the infrastructure. infrastructure. So again, a combination of tax credits, uh, public investments uh, in, in in these areas, and working with universities um, and and working across borders as well. So, uh, for example, the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, came to India. They did workshops around the country with universities and said, where can we? Where do our our visions overlap? And they identified three areas where they said we can jointly pool money together for investments in, in R&D infrastructure. Um, finally, uh, diplomatic cooperation. A lot of this, again, it cannot be done within one country. Uh, obviously, there are domestic reasons for whether it's security, whether it's domestic politics. But ultimately, we all benefit if we can coordinate across uh, national boundaries. And this extends to standards. It, it extends to investment. It extends to training efforts. 
uh, supply chain resilience. So we're seeing a host of bilateral and multilateral or minilateral uh, agreements being made uh, between India and other countries to, to help in, in, in these regards. India, EU, India, you know, with, with smaller countries in India's neighborhood. Um, so uh, these, I, I would say, is sort of India's broad approach to technology and DPI as, as uh, digital public infrastructure, as Anit mentioned, plays an integral part in that. Thank you. Thank you for your interventions. I also forgot to make myself description. So I'm a man in its 40s on a gray suit, blue shirt, uh, light brown skin, and, and brown hair somehow, turning to white at spots, and a beard. A beard. Well, uh, just uh, to, to give some feedback and some some insights on your uh, quite insightful uh, uh, presentations. One, it's impressive how connected and how close we are in so many different details. When you were discussing and presenting um, the broader uh, India strategy for technology, I could totally relate to existing programs initiatives either existing or in the making in Brazil as a national artificial intelligence plan, our incentives for R&D and our challenges to cope with, uh, to deal with uh, being behind for quite a while and then trying to recover uh, the identification of core areas for investment. I would add that we have additionally the challenge of bioeconomy in our context, but I imagine you have it as well. So it totally relates, if we translate into Portuguese and into scale, <laughs> for sure. But other than that, it's, it's really, really close and certainly there's uh, a great uh, room for a conversation, cooperation, interaction, and m mutual learning on what worked and what did not, and on the reasons why it might have happened in each case, and then to, to build together potential avenues for, for cooperation, collaboration, and particularly for development. But going back to the topic of digital public infrastructures and bring, building on the presentation, I think that uh, also uh, you, you made it a, a fantastic point on explaining that on the one side it's uh, really, uh, digital public infrastructures are a concept which is really as close to us as a Bosa Familia card and as complex as a seven line with the seven different particular aspects which somehow compose a, bo a broader framing on what things uh, could be and should be in order to be uh, interoperable or serving as a platform to the society and so on. And this somehow relates to my initial uh, position in which when we looked at that, we thought, wow, it's really similar to what we are doing, but maybe we're missing some of the points. So being complex and, and, and verbose as that is somehow needed to make sure we are not leaving relevant points behind. So, and, go, and maybe going back to those topics is quite of a checklist in order to validate and to verify to which extent uh, a broader approach of digital public infrastructures is uh, being implemented or not, what might be uh, uh, missing, or even to reframe the concept of the case may be from a Brazilian perspective and whenever uh, local uh, uh, Costumes, practices, and policies may suggest uh, an equivalent result with somehow different uh, core principles. Not that much to the extent it would l cease to be a digital public infrastructure in the broader sense, but which different flavors could we bring to the conversation? And I'd like to share as well that from our uh, 
mission to India, we had several learning moments and several insights. And maybe one of the most important and most transformative is how minimalism play a role in the conversation on technology. One thing I think was really important is to understand that mostly and usually DPIs work as components, as building blocks, uh, which perform microservices, minimal tasks, and then they make things happen. It's not uh, like a small payment transfer, identifying someone. So there is a core component activity which could be used for a host of services, not, and not only public, but also for the society as a whole. And then, uh, this is something I was going to ask, but I think I, 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 I somehow got it, which is here we have a challenge when uh, we try to bring into practice your beautiful model of uh, build what works in scale rather than trying to scale what worked in is small because you cannot necessarily validate which extent things are scalable unless you try it at scale. And then so it somehow it says go big. And on the other hand, when you use a minimalist approach and you try to go to components, you're saying go small. <laughs> so build small to go big. This is uh, a good uh, framing and and maybe it's it sounds paradoxical at the very beginning but it's really really powerful and insightful so build small to go big and make things happen because when you make it small you can replicate it thousands of times and then it makes a bigger approach it's part of the broader philosophy which really impacted us and really transformed us and really uh, helped us to, to understand the concept and try to adapt and adopt uh, together with a crucial point on that, which is interoperability, right? For, in order for those components to work, those small components to work, they need to talk to one another. And, and there again, there's something which is uh, really impactful and, and uh, mind-blowing from an Indian perspective, that interoperability is to make uh, machines to have conversations even if they are in different languages. And India, from uh, the foreigner's perspective, is all about that. It's about collaboration and conversations on a global scale on, of billions happening across different cultures and languages within a single country. So you are interoperable by nature, by default. <laughs> We're struggling sometimes to, to make interoperability happen within a single language and you have a platform with 22 or 23 official languages. So you have interoperability so embedded that sometimes it does not even get to the presentation. But it, it, it's so, so crucial and so, so relevant that, that I wanted to bring this to, to the conversation. Also, uh, uh, another uh, room point I'd like to, to make. You mentioned the relevance of uh, DPIs for climate change. And here in Brazil, uh, one of the DPIs we are working to implement is what we call the Rural Environmental Registry, which is uh, so far a platform, or soon to be a DPI or an ongoing DPI process in which we not only uh, map the Brazilian territory and the rural properties, but we identify which parts are covered by rural production, which parts are covered by forests, which is a mandatory requirement for every single rural property in Brazil to keep part of their original or recovered forests, which part are rivers. So we're building a geographical database with relevant information for agricultural production and for environmental and climate purposes, which is to be, is already, but it should be even more uh, open, interoperable with information which could be used to leverage that critical aspect of understanding what's going on and what could be done concerning 
climate uh, challenges and climate emer emergencies. So uh, building together, we have something to contribute to the conversation uh, in that field. But most importantly, I guess that uh, one of the challenges we have by now is to bring uh, sustainability as the core topic of the conversation uh, to real life through implementation of policies and implementation happens necessarily through digital channels nowadays and they work better if they are powered by smart strategies such as uh, DPIs. So our challenge here of trying to build things at scale and we are dealing with different uh, uh, existing DPIs, we have our PICs, we have uh, our uh, national identity system, we have inter data interoperability services which provide information automatically from government to other governments and to the civil society. And we're starting to deal with sectoral data uh, DPIs on environment, education, and so on. And this is an ongoing challenge. So just just as my, my round of remarks, uh, I'd like to thank you once again for, for your insightful presentations that gave us room not only to help to disseminate the context in Brazil, and this is a, a, a uh, a video which I imagine will be used in our courses uh, in the forefront to maybe to understand potential next steps because uh, the National School of Public Administration is usually at the forefront of innovation. So if the the coming of uh, Raul Mata and David Eves and a vision of DPIs was so transformative uh, in a 10 month period, I imagine which could be part of the next wave of innovations, and I totally relate to the Belen Aberta, which could be a fantastic case to be showcased here at the Innovation Week. And more than that, we are in the process of building uh, DPIs to transform how policy is made. Having uh, such good interlocutors of, uh, as you are uh, is certainly a way to make it happen. So I'd like to thank you and give the floor for back to Natalia. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> oh, okay, so now uh, we have the, the questions from the audience. I don't know how we should coordinate this. Okay, thank you, Kata. And then uh, you feel free also to to share the, the microphone and uh, interact. We are at home, so let's make it very informal. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Anit. Thank you uh, for the very interesting and insightful presentations. Uh, I'm, I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, how India's uh, federalist structure has impacted the, um, the rollout of DPIs in the country, and especially how the uh, centralization, decentralization issues uh, in a federalist country impacted the, um, or enabled the, the development of other or new DPIs. Do you see uh, subnational governments as uh, DPIs uh, developers uh, outside of a centralized um, uh, national uh, infrastructure uh, approach. Um, yeah, I think that well, the issue of innovation in, in a very vast and, and um, multifaceted country, perhaps uh, you might mention. Not just to ask how this national mission works. You said that you solved the problems with the local governments with this national mission. So just to tell us a little bit more about it. Um, do I, I, I can go first with the sub-national and then do I, you can take the second part. It's a really interesting question. I mean, really interesting. And I'm thinking as I'm answering. So 
I will probably write a paper with you about this. There are technologies from on the digital public infrastructure that we identified, and this is not something that we knew that this is DPI. We were trying to solve specific problems. The first problem, and this is something that I mentioned, is how do you verify who you claim to be? Before Aadhaar, there are 25 ways that a person could verify who she claimed to be. You have an affidavit, you go to a court in front of a notary, you say that your father's name, your mother's name, then there is a way of bank. If you had a bank account, you could use that, voter's identity card. But each one had a challenge that they were not universal and they were not verifiable. So there were, there were issues of duplication, issues of gaps. So that's why the first DPI was. Now, how does it relate to a federal system? That was a trick. So the national government can take on some missions, as Dhruva was saying. We thought that Aadhaar could be a national mission. You have a national planning commission. It was actually housed in the planning commission. Then planning commission is a national. They have national uh, mandate. And the central government, the federal government, can roll it out because it's in their jurisdiction. Now, that's the technical part. So you go roll it out. But how does federal structure play into this? Right? The way we went about, and this is for every DPI component, is that the implementation is actually done by the state government. So every state was brought on board and said, this is a project that benefits everyone. You have to do a lot of political bargaining also, and get the states as the enrollers. So the enrollment is done under the state's jurisdiction, but with the standards set by a federal agency. So the way the rollout happened was the states would enroll enrolling agencies. We would, the central uh, agency would set the standards for verification, deduplication, and issuance. So that was the fit. Now, n not all states thought this was a good idea. Because, why? Because, well, they knew that there was something going on where you would transfer the money or, you know, identify. A lot of corruption happened because people were not identified. There were false records. There were even land records, which were in names of people who were dead. So some, some governments, some politicians understood that this is going to be reduce the chances of corruption. And you can identify somebody uniquely. So you had to give something else to say, OK, if you do this, then you get X amount of money. So there was some money which was also transferred to the states to do this. Finally, I think this is interesting from Brazil, we have a very similar federal fiscal system. So big money is taxes collected at the federal level down to the states. And big programs, like Dhruva was mentioning, the education program, health program, were <coughs> mostly the money going straight from the federal to the local, right? Through the states, but mostly local. So slowly, the federal government started tying that money with Aadhaar. Said that, I won't give you this money directly until all your beneficiaries are enrolled in Aadhaar. Now, if the money doesn't come, at least per district 10 government servants don't get their salaries, right? So a little bit of that. So, but it was, it was a process, especially on the ID side. And then when people understood, 
they started innovating. So a lot of the programs that were for the state government, federal government programs like Bolsa Familia is a federal program, but states also had small scholarships for students, for teachers. That money they started innovating on Aadhaar to say, okay, we get everybody here, we have with Aadhaar another number for this program, and we give the mothers, we give this. So they started then innovating. And some states are good, better. Some places like Bangalore, which has a lot of IT capacity, they were better. Hyderabad, some states in the north. But it has been a process. And now everybody understands the importance. But still when you go, I remember we tried to do fertilizer subsidy reform with Aadhaar. It was very, I mean, I'm on record, but it was really, really difficult because fertilizer subsidy is very complicated politically. Farmers' lobby is very strong. So on the failures that Guy was mentioning, one of the lessons was that push as much as you can, even if it is not your best case scenario, stay there, let the politics work itself out, and then when there is a gap, when you see a change in the government or change in technology, or for example, price of fertilizer increasing because of Ukraine war, war in the Ukraine, then you go in and then push it through. So it's a wait and watch approach. So it's, sometimes it's, a, it's technology, but mostly it's art of politics. You know, one, one thing is uh, public policy or public services in India are actually tr not very good. Um, you know, if you compare to many other countries, there's still massive gaps in terms of health, education, improvement. There have been very significant improvements compared to in my lifetime in the last 20 years, even I've seen major improvements. But it's still, we're ca still in catch up mode. Um, and you see this when you go to India. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of red tape a lot of bureaucracy, there is corruption, there is politics, um, there's lack of capacity. So for example, uh, the top civil service in India is less than 4,000 people for governing a country of 1.4 billion people and they staff the senior positions in most major ministries in the federal government and in the state government. So 20, they are also the senior official, executive officials in, in the state government. So you just have 4,000 people in the key service governing this massive country. So we have a, we have a problem, uh, and, and it's been a historical problem. Sometimes the big successes, despite all of that, have happened when the government is focused on what we call a mission mode, or uh, we, in, in Indian English we, say, we call these schemes sometimes, which is in, because in, in English, many other English speakers think of a scheme as something negative, they, they're like a, you're, plot, you're, you're uh, crafty or plotting or something. But in, in India we call these schemes. But these are essentially government programs or government missions. And some of those, not all of them, some of them have been unveiled with a lot of fanfare and not delivered. But there have been some very notable successes. Um, and generally, those, you know, and sometimes the very same bureaucracy, they cannot deliver basic public services, can pull off something really remarkable and fantastic. So it's not, sometimes not even the, it's the people are not the problem, the bureaucracy is not the problem, sometimes it's the right set of incentives and structures. If you think about those that have been successful recently, they've usually involved a high level uh, leader or coordinator, sometimes a minister or a governor, somebody with political power uh, or has access to political power. Uh, it requires money, so it has to be budgeted. So once you have the resources, you can, you can use it. If you can't get it through a budgetary process, then you've lost at the first hurdle. You require a single window clearance for all the different things needed for permissions, for land uh, acquisition for you know for whatever you need to get the project done and you need uh, targets that are somehow measurable or deliverable and generally most of the successful programs you, you know we need to open this many bank accounts we need to get this many people online and so you need that verification those those objectives um, so most successful missions whether in the technological realm or generally in the public policy realm have involved some combination of those factors key political uh, uh, leadership, res financial resources, a single window clearing, you know, single clearing house, 
uh, for decision making and, and, and verifiable targets. Um, and I would say recently I would look at the semiconductor mission in India as an example of that. They had a $10, $11, billion, $10 billion budget. Uh, they spent it in less than three years. They have uh, created a, a semiconductor manufacturing facility in India. They're currently, they've built out f capacity for five times what they are currently, so they can scale up. Uh, and they've distributed amongst different states as well, so to get political buy-in uh, from that. Um, they've spent their whole $10 billion and, and concluded major agreements in just three years. So that's, uh, I think, a good example of a major thing that we, we will see the success, we will see the actual chips being produced in the next uh, three to five years, but it's very much underway uh, in, a, in a way that was not imaginable five years ago. Other things have been a little bit more vague, you know, vaguely defined. Uh, the AI, I would say the AI policy still has a lot more clarification to do. Um, so it's a mixed bag. I wouldn't say these have all been successes. Uh, they're different levels. Um, but uh, I, I, in, a, in a very difficult environment to pursue any policy objectives, I find these are the these have been the hallmarks of successful efforts. I'm sorry for asking again. Um, on the missions uh, uh, issue, uh, Mr. Rajshankar, um, is there a specific legal framework that helps missions to get delivered? And uh, are those missions uh, nationally known? There's like three missions, five missions, or like 28 missions? So m many of them are known, particularly those that affect people's day-to-day -day life and have political value. Hmm? I'll give one interesting example of that. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know all the details on it. I actually probably knows more of the details around it. We, uh, you know, uh, getting, um, this is politically very uh, important, India was subsidizing uh, compressed gas for cooking. Hmm? Uh, so, you know, we don't have piped, uh, cooking and the alternative is people cook on uh, wood or other materials if you're in villages this is dangerous it's not good for health you know people are uh, breathing in uh, uh, sm you know, smoke and all that. so uh, natural gas was seen as a cleaner alternative but in, because it's not been piped you would get a cylinder you'd get like a metal you know uh, tank uh, delivered to you and uh, people under certain um, conditions you could get it for free or sub heavily subsidized um, uh, from the you know, local officials now what they were finding was there were a lot of people actually availing of the subsidy who were probably rich enough to afford other cleaning fuels or were not they had some other system in their house so they, were, they were not getting that that gas cylinder but there was a lot of corruption built into the system. So they had a process where you can voluntarily give up your subsidy. And this would save millions of dollars. And it, this proved to be quite successful, that uh, people actually came out and it was seen as kind of a patriotic mission to sort of deliver on that. So that had a lot of political value. It was uh, people actually participated in it. Um, again, the poor knew, in the rural areas knew about it more than the rich in cities. Um, but it was a, a sort of a case of, you know, uh, raising awareness towards a, a similar one was uh, giving free light bulbs that were higher, uh, what's the term, uh, there's a term for uh, like um, uh, more efficient light bulbs, LED light bulbs. Yeah. Uh, so replacing old light bulbs with new light bulbs for very low cost or no cost to the user. So these have been some that, again, average people know about it because they've all availed of it. Uh, others are a bit more, you know, technical, a little bit more. So there are probably hundreds of these schemes at this, and and the states have their own ones as well. I've just been talking about the national level ones. Um, but again, the the success record has been very mixed. Some, uh, you know, some of the educational schemes haven't delivered as much as they have. Some you don't hear about as much anymore. You, they were opened, you know, the great fanfare. But they are now very much associated. You see in the advertising with the political leadership of 
with the ruling party, again, at the national state level. Um, in Delhi, where I was living, uh, we, there was an anti-malaria, you know, efforts you can be made if you clean your neighborhood and you would get some government subsidies for it to, to, so to uh, bring down cases of malaria. So it was a public health exercise. That was a, a state government-led uh, effort. Um, so uh, again, there, there are many hundreds of these. Uh, I, I've mostly been focusing on the te technology ones because those are new, uh, relatively speaking, um, and in some ways more, more exciting for the topic at, at hand. But uh, there are many hundreds of these schemes. Uh, one thing, actually, just for everyone's benefit, I, I think th when you talk about DPIs, and, and um, uh, th there are some differences, and I wonder if it, it might be helpful to hear a difference between PICS and uh, UPI, and, and what distinguishes uh, yeah, Sorry, I mean, I uh, normally, uh, you know, the, the Dhruva is right. So the PICS and DP, uh, in, within DPI, for example, I, and Guy can um, testify to it, the models can be different. It doesn't have to be the same model. The principles are the important part. For example, with PICS and UPI, the unified payments interface, which is India's equivalent to PICS, the switch is owned by a non-government entity. So it is government 51% share, 49% private sector share. So banks, government banks own 51%. And private banks and other financial institutions own 49%. So NPCI, National Payments Corporation of India, is the owner of the switch, not the central bank, which is very different from PICS, because PICS is the switch is a central bank switch. And it's owned by the banks, especially the, the central, I mean, the, the government banks. And that creates some challenges or differences. For UPI, the Unified Payments Interface, any fintech who agree with the, the regulations can get on board. Although there is obviously some setup costs. In PICS, I think it's more difficult for fintechs to participate if they are not banks, right? For, because of the regulation that the Brazilian Central Bank has related to fraud prevention, related to uh, payments. So that's a big, uh, that's a difference because what it does is that India's system is more open for innovation. Whereas PIX is a very good payment platform, but limited scope for innovation because the regulatory structure is different. I think that's, that's the basic idea. But the philosophy is the same low cost payments to the large section of the population and making it into a payments infrastructure rather than a payments platform. <laughs> See, there's, there's a, that's the difference I find. It's a payment infrastructure and not a payment platform. And in that, I think India and Brazil are exactly on the same page. The implementation, there are differences. And thank you. Um, I would like to add a final question, and I think it's a very short question and with short answers, and I would like to hear from you both. Um, I had a different question in mind, so I changed after hearing from you. You've uh, mentioned different aspects, features, or factors that um, contribute to a successful initiative or to the success of the initiatives. And we have a lot of uh, variables related to money, to the, the, the urge, the skills, people, technology available, and so on. Uh, trying to um, bring the, an app to the table and as a school of government, I would say that at least from the places and the discussions where I have participated, the lack of skills is uh, uh, a, an important factor. The lack of uh, people, qualified people or uh, in, um, 
involve the teams. And this is not a very easy um, problem to solve and not very fast to solve. It takes time. Uh, considering that we have millions of public servants and they are um, struggling and they are facing challenges that technology can help solve DPI and other solutions. Um, how can we help as government schools to build the capacity? I think that we already, for your, just to give you information, we already offer very different um, ways of contributing. We not only train people in terms of courses, regular courses that goes from two hour course to a doctor, um, uh, but we also offer innovation lab, we are, offer um, workshops, we have research, we have a, a, a journal, we, we do data analysis, we, we try to cover all the, 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 the faces of the com comprehension of the problem and the development of skills in terms of the public servants. But I still feel, as an executive director, that we talk in, in clusters. We talk about technology with the technology people. We talk about uh, SDGs with the SDGs people. And when you hear Technology people talk about SDGs is a very different um, <laughs> content approach uh, from when you hear SDG people talking about take their perspective on how technology uh, influenced their subject. Uh, we have a virtual school of government here that is based on technology solutions and we have we, 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 at, we, we made a lot of progress in terms of technology, in terms of access. Uh, we have 5.8 million certificates uh, distributed f for the past five years to everyone in, in uh, every place in Brazil. And 66% of countries have access uh, we have at least one student from 66% of countries that have, um, huh? yeah, countries around the world. We have at least one student from 66% of countries that have ac uh, uh, subscribed to our uh, platform. But we have a mismatch in terms of pedagogical um, advances. So we have still the same format of courses and content, and we are still training um, in old school ways, although we have this platform with that much of uh, um, um, reach. That's just an example of how technology does not uh, is not sufficient to <laughs> promote the uh, and also there is a it's unbalanced the rhythm the, the the speed on how so how my question finally is how can we as a school of government contribute to strengthen or um, to promote these type of initiatives uh, that's uh, an easy 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 answer I <laughs> I, I'm not in a place to I'm not a public servant I've never been a public servant I'm not an uh, educator <laughs> okay Please, I would like to compliment her question. It's because we are from Roraima, the government of Roraima, and we have the same worries that you have. Not only about that, but as public servants, how to, 
to know how did you develop a methodology or something like that to achieve um, not rural, not rural people, but public servants in difficult area for study as the country of the, the state of Roraima, that is one of the, the states of the country, but it's really far, there is a different logistic to, to be achieved by people. And in public digital area, we are, two days ago we were talking about this, how to approach, how to develop our infrastructure in digital, digital public works. Yeah? And we have difficulties with materials, with equipment, and especially with people, public servants, to be formed, to have uh, courses on that. And it is especially this area that she was talking about. Because when you talk about digital service, they think just about people connected with computers. But you need to connect all other people in our secretariat, for example. We have these federal transferences used by other people, and they need to, to know all the new technologies to use, how to use uh, TransferiGov at the platform, and the better computer they have, yeah? And they are not from the area of computers, yeah? They are, they are from other areas where they need to work and they have to be um, updated with this, this all knowledge, yeah? How did the US federal government gave this support for the states? Uh, as you said, that each state had a, a different situation as we have in Roraima. Yeah, that's my question. I, I, you know, I think both from the point of view of educating public servants and um, uh, delivering to different constituencies, there is no easy solution. And I think anybody who pretends that there is is is, uh, is not being genuine. Um, you know, I, I, this a couple of thoughts as you were talking, which I think are very interesting and maybe worth exploring more. Um, one is uh, on the training side. Um, you know there seems to be a constant need, and this is not just in the public sector, this is in the private sector too, of mid-career training. You know, we, we, we all, you know, we've operated under this assumption that we do our education from K through 12 as children, and then we do a college degree and a graduate degree, and then we're done for the rest of our life. Education is done. But how, a lot of countries, a lot of different economies are struggling with this issue of there's a need for periodic mid-career skilling and training and updating, and how do you do it? Do you make it mandatory? Do you, uh, you know, uh, how do you incentivize it? I know in Singapore, they're public servants because they have a lot of resources. They can, they can uh, and they're very good public servants. They can, uh, do, they're doing some experimentation with uh, sending people back in their 50s to mid, for mid, short mid-career courses and sort of reskilling them in a different area because they're finding the needs are always different. But it's still very, even even these very advanced economies are struggling with that challenge. Um, in the U.S., uh, it was just an article in the news last week. Uh, the, the diplomatic academy there has created a new unit. It's a 10-day course, I think, on cyber cybersecurity because they found this is now so integral to day-to-day -day diplomacy that and most people are not aware of you know everything from uh, ran, ransomware to you know there are new new challenges coming up all the time which when they started as diplomats were were not issues at all so there's uh, there's no obvious answer i think but uh, i think the kind of mid career reskilling a more interdisciplinary approach having again having technologists talk to economists having security officials talk to you know teach uh, 
is the way forward, but there's not a one size fits all. I, I think it's very on the delivery side. It's even more challenging. I feel uh, you know some of the most interesting. Con I was at um, the Indian equivalent of this institution. We have a um, uh, academy for training. It's a, it's a very nice location up in the mountains in India. Uh, they take you away. Uh, but I was actually uh, paired up with somebody who was an expert in a, a, a very remote region of India, in the northeast of India, which is perhaps similar in some ways. So in terms of the relationship to uh, the main uh, population centers. And they have a lot of uh, minorities there, a lot of tribal, uh, with their own, uh, tribal groups with their own distinct cultural identities. And he was, I, I was giving the big picture, and his job was how do you deliver it for those people? And it, w it was very interesting for me because uh, a lot of it was almost like you have to sometimes advocate for the opposite and, you know, to, to, to get to achieve the same outcome was not always a street for building a road in an area that is contested by two different tribal groups. How do you do that, right? And any decision will advantage some people and disadvantage other people, which makes it political. So how do you build stakeholder groups? How do you, um, a lot of societies are still very either patriarchal or, you know, like, they, so again, they would marginalize women, even in a very democratic system or marginalize more vulnerable groups. So it's, uh, I think it's a challenge and this idea that there's one size fits all and that digital solutions will change everything. One thing I think we, this is again a collective thing, the private sector as much as the public sector needs to do a better job of making simpler user interfaces. Meaning when you have an app on your phone and a lot of people are going to, their technology is not gonna be through a computer, it's gonna be through a, a simple cheap phone to have easier, simpler, you know, right now you open an app and there are 50 different things opening up, but having more target, you know, simpler, making the user experience simpler. Um, you know, if you're, if you're an older person who's never used a phone before and you have three things you want to do with your bank account, you know, which is you make sure your money is in, transfer it to a relative, you know, think, have very, make it easier. Uh, but sometimes, I know this in India, we, we're not very, uh, good about making it uh, for the consumer, for the end user, making products that are uh, simple to use. Just quickly, I mean, I, I think, oh wow, it's, we, have, we have been talking for a while. Um, I had something like similar, you know, I, I, I always liked when I was in uh, the think tank of the Ministry of Finance, I like two things. One is I will get students who are coming into the service. It's called the training period, as Zuba was mentioning, two year. They would come to our in institute to learn about fiscal, and I, I used to be on the expenditure side. So uh, how do you run a program, run, and how do you transfer the money? But the interesting, more interesting groups were people from like H Horaima, India's equivalent of the state service, people who are in the state service, who are in the 50s, 10 more years of service left, and they were sent to us to retrain. Now, two things happened. One is, some people were, 10 more years, after that I'm going to retire, I have no interest in this. Another group, I have 10 more years, I want to make a change. There were two very different things. And I could see in the class of 40, 50 people, these 10 are not interested. Right? So the objective is not that you take those 10 and say, bye bye, you know, go somewhere, don't come to class, like a professor would say in a university tailor your course or your lecture in a way that everyone gets something out of it. So the next 10 years, for example, when I taught last time in 2012, I told them, with Aadhaar, everything is going to be on the basis of this ID, and then we will do uh, payments. This will remain. So for the next 10 years, you have to do it. Right, So kind of tailoring some of this course, and it will get easier with some background, not AI, but some kind of you know 
analytics at the background. For example, I don't know what your, uh, what the consumption mode is. Is it YouTube? Is it uh, your own, uh, you know, platform? You could start doing more tailored, you know, uh, for some, for example, somebody from Horaima versus somebody from Mato Grosso do Sul, like trying to make those differences. Dhruva was saying that what is what is the challenge that you are trying to solve? So I don't know. I have not you know looked at the courses in the Indian uh, training service, but I always found it good for the people who are making the course, like me, teaching, to also absorb the lessons. So if Madam came from Horaima and said. Uh, that doesn't work very much. Take that and then redo the course in a way that reflects the reality on the ground. I think sometimes that's a kind of disconnect. Sorry, I, but thank you. Just a, a short reminder, I was browsing here the, our virtual school of government and I found a course on particularly the topic of how to make uh, an integrated government, how to build a government in which the technology aspects are connected with the policy aspects and with the implementation. It's a 20 hour, 25 hours course, it's quite recent, it talks about integration and interoperability, so it's somehow connected with the DPI conversation, and maybe it could be it's a course to be tested and then to verify which are the ones who are like with shiny eyes trying to get new knowledge and which are those non-responsive and then keep going on that trajectory. It could be a good start. We have oh, good. Fantastic. So let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I think we have covered most of the what was possible for us to cover. And uh, I think that uh, we still, it's an open door that we leave here for us to keep talking due to our uh, similarities and also to our things that we complement, to, to, we add to each other. So um, uh, very interesting for me from a psychologist and education background, always to be part of these dis discussions. And thank you, Guy, also for your presence and contributions in this agenda here in Brazil and in the Ministry of Management. And we invite you all to later on um, share the link with your colleagues so we can uh, spread the word and uh, f foment this discussion here. Okay, thank you.